This is a talk given at Newburgh Medical Center, February 2017. The title is Evolving Shoulder Approach Non-Traumatic Rotator Cuff Tears by the GFU Primary Care Team. So the first thing to note is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Rotator Cuff Tear CPG from 2010. And if we notice here, we just scan the different recommendations for surgery, exercise, corticosteroid injections, non-steroidal activity, activity modifications, and exercise for non-full thickness tears. What we notice is that the recommendations are non-definitives for most different conditions. So exercise, it's neutral or inconclusive. Corticosteroid injections are inconclusive. Steroid and non-steroidal is inconclusive. So most of the CPG is not helpful unless the patients are symptomatic and they have a tear, then the recommendation is limited for support. And if it's not a full thickness tear, then the recommendation for exercise and non-steroidal inflammation, infl inflammatory drugs, does also give moderate support. But many patients fall in between these recommendations and therefore the CPG is not much help. So we end up with is uh, a profile of initial screening where we are trying to determine not the exact diagnosis, but the potential of the per per person with shoulder symptoms of whether or not they qualify for rehab. So we have, you know, history, physical examination, and then exa checking for red or yellow flags. We're trying to decide, are they appropriate? For physical therapy, do they need a referral or are they just not appropriate? Some of the key red flags that have been determined, especially in the a newer paper using the star shoulder approach by McClure and Michener, we're looking for tumor, infection, fracture, uh, unreduced dislocation, neurologic lesions, and visceral pathology, all of which can be referred to the shoulder. And then there's even some very uh, unusual problems like Parsonage-Turner syndrome, which can uh, express as shoulder pain. Having ruled those out though, then this, the second level of screening has to do with what anatomic or pathologic conditions occurring and how does that drive care. And so Michener and McClure had two different uh, levels of a classification one had to do with the origin of symptoms uh, being shoulder uh, focused and they were divided into subacromial pain, adhesive capsulitis, glenohumeral instability, and other. And then the second level had to do with their potential for rehab, so whether or not they had high irritability, low irritability, or something in between. So let's start with the pathoanatomic diagnosis. And we see here we have the measures um, that are being used that are key positive and key negative findings in the two rows, and then different categories of anatomic problems in the columns. And we're going to focus right now for this talk on the subacromial pain syndrome. We can see the classic representation of this problem where we have an impingement sign and there's a few of these, the near Hawkins or Job tests, painful arc, pain with isometric resistance, weakness, and atrophy. Those are, would be the positive indicators of subacromial pain syndrome. Negative indicators would be either signs of, that fit another column or significant loss of motion or instability. A key problem with the diagnostic model that's trying to label something like a labral tear or a rotator cuff tear is the age-associated changes in these structures. And a good example is a newer study, 2016, that used MRI of non-symptomatic shoulders and had um, radiologists judge whether there were labral tears or not. And one radiologist judged 72% of the asymptomatic patients as having label tears, the other 55%, making the diagnosis of a superior label tear questionable in terms of its connection to pain. Similarly, rotator cuff tears occur in 30% of people over 55. And here's a table from a study that looked at non-symptomatic 
side of a person who had a rotator cuff procedure and their um, rate of tears. And we can see here is that the control subjects that had no pain versus the non-symptomatic side of a person who had pain on the other shoulder, we can see that even though they're non-symptomatic, many of these patients had tears, especially in the 55 to 70 year old range. Coupled with this frequency of pathology to occur with age, especially in terms of rotator cuff tears and labral problems, is new prognostic studies that show that essentially behavioral health factors are stronger predictors than structural factors in people that have rotator cuff tears, suggesting that similar to other pain problems like low back pain is that behavioral factors may be more important in terms of determining treatment outcome than structural factors like rotator cuff tear. So with this backdrop, the question becomes is can PTs even classify patients effectively based on signs and symptoms in either having an anatomic disorder or something more global? And this study directly addresses this problem by matching up therapist judgments with uh, MRI findings. And what they found was is that PT interview and physical exam was just marginally accurate in determining uh, anatomic-based diagnosis. They were somewhat better, but still inconsistent with a more global uh, diagnostic criteria, such an example as subacromial disorder, um, disorders of passive restraints like in the glenohumeral joint, like a frozen shoulder, a degenerative arthritic condition, just general arthritis, and then instability. So we look at what impairments might be connected to pain. This may be an alternative approach where we're looking at uh, how, what remedial factors would we could identify for treatment that might have a positive effect on the outcome. So modifiable prognostic factors that have been identified are scapulothoracic dyskinesia, active abduction and forward flexion, abduction and forward flexion uh, strength, and then smoking status. Non-modifiable factors include age, symptom duration, race, tear size, degree of retraction, and presence of superior humeral head migration. It should be noted that the supraspinatus and external rotation range strength to date have not been determined to be prognostic factors. So this, this study is interesting because it identifies the impairments that one might focus on to try to um, impart a change, a positive change in somebody with a known tear. And here the, the known age match differences in pain, range of motion, strength, scapulothoracic motion, and then some very detailed measurements of the glenohumeral joint itself are documented, and then some ideas for a goal setting in terms of in remediating impairments are listed here. Now, programs that tend to focus on impairments um, for patients with um, non-traumatic rotator cuff tears do have some support. And so this study is is important because it shows the comparison between some common treatments um, that are used for non-traumatic rotator cuff tears and ideally the physical therapy, although not specified, would address the impairments that were listed above. So the sample in this case was all non-traumatic, greater than 55 years old, had an isolated supraspinatus tear. So the tears were not major, they would have been minor tears not involving, say, for example, the subscapularis or infraspinatus. The, two, the three arms of the study included physical therapy alone, physical therapy plus acromioplasty, and then an actual surgical repair. This graph here we see the left is a pain and VAS, and then here we have strength, and then the three groups that have been specified. So the, the dotted line here is the PT only, um, the open circles, which is the 
uh, thicker hash line is the PT plus the acromioplasty, and then the dark line is the repair. And what we can see is at 24 months, all three groups have equivalent outcomes in terms of pain and strength. So this supports the, the selection of the clinical team in any three of the treatments that seem to uh, earn the best um, outcome. So the problem is that many of these patients fall into the gray zone, and so there's no definite indication for or against uh, the surgical or non-surgical approaches, and often patients are frustrated by the lack of certainty related to their problem. And so we have this kind of competition between pathoanatomic diagnosis and then rehabilitation uh, classifications. So one proposal by, Mitch, by McClure and Michener was to base part of the decision-making or potential for rehab based on patient irritability and whether this could be brought down over time so patients could qualify to participate in remediation of their impairments. So for example, somebody with low irritability has relatively low pain, especially at night and at rest, minimal pain with overpressure, um, and fairly low disability. This person might respond positively to exercise because they're able to tolerate it better. Or somebody who has high pain, they have consistent uh, pain at night and at rest, pain before end range, have high disability. These patients are in no uh, position to pursue uh, rehabilitation. And then you have these people in the middle. So this first case is a 38-year-old woman, right upper back scapula pain, worse with her arm out in front of her. So when the consult, I entered the consultation, she had her arm, she demonstrated the painful movements when she's holding her arm into 90 degrees of flexion, she'd get upper back um, related symptoms. And her upper back was pain free on spinal examination and her passive active range of motion was was also pain-free on end range, but there were definite weaknesses with the shoulder girdle in terms of external rotation and abduction. And so the idea was is that this was a non-specific kind of upper back shoulder problem, likely related to scapula dyskinesia and contributing to some subacromial impingement type of symptoms. So she was low irritability, so she was a good candidate for rehabilitation and watchful waiting um, with definite impairments. And so that was the, the approach. So this second case is of a seven-year-old female who fell in December putting up ornaments landing on her left shoulder and immediately started having left shoulder pain and presented in clinic with her arm held at her side. The key objective finding was a disconnect between the amount of passive range of motion, approximately 100 degrees and limited by pain, so before end range, and active range of motion, which the patient had pain just initiating movements at the glenohumeral joint in all directions. So there was clear compensations of the shoulder, but no glenohumeral motion. So this disconnect between active and passive range of motion um, showed two things, that the joint was highly irritable and that there, there was um, a suspicion of a rotator cuff tear and they were unable to do strength tests because of pain. So a traumatic rotator cuff tear was suspected and the patient was referred for an MRI which was then positive. The other possible diagnosis is, is an acute bursitis that was activated by the fall. Another example of a rotator cuff tear is a 75-ish year old woman that had uh, pain lacerating from her left lateral shoulder with different arm movements. Passive range of motion in this case was full and pain-free, while active range of motion was less than 90. Again, strong disconnect between passive and active range of motion. There was definite external and abduction uh, rotator cuff weakness and a rota an atraumatic rotator cuff tear was suspected. So this patient's really uh, a good candidate for a self-management 
Um, notice that there's full pain-free range of motion, and so they're in the low irritability category. So even though they have a tear, it's atraumatic, and um, they likely have had it when they were asymptomatic uh, prior to this uh, development of pain. So there's a chance that she may respond to conservative care.